Hey guys, what's up? My name is Ashton Gleckman. Hope you guys are all doing well. Today we're going to be doing a behind the score for a recent score that I did called Hidden, which is a film that's produced by Project Witness and Big Productions, uh, and it covers the story of children during the Holocaust. So it, it has this very strong emotional backbone to it, sometimes dark, sometimes sad, sometimes happy, um, you know, having to do with the stories of when people save the children. It gets a little bit happy, and so it has a lot of emotional diversity. So what I wanted to do is take a look at how I wrote a cue. Um, of course, there were a large plethora of cues written for the film, right around an hour and 13 minutes of music in three and a half weeks. But today, I'm just going to take a look at 1M1, which is the opening of the film. It's the first cue that I wrote, and I'm going to be walking you guys through how I sample um, and the decisions that I made having to do with orchestration, harmony, etc. And uh, if you guys have any further questions having to do with this um, cue, please leave that down in the comments, and I will 100% respond to you and uh, fill you guys in on any information that you guys are interested in. So again, thank you so much for watching and here's the cue.
So the first thing I want to talk about is the strings. So I talked a little bit about this in the behind the scenes featurette, but we had a fantastic violinist from Montreal named Nathalie Bonin come in and play some some beautiful, beautiful violin. Um, so she played on quite a few cues and a lot of it was improv and a lot of it was notated. Uh, but just in general, it added this otherworldly presence to the score and uh, it was incredible to work with her because she's just so darn talented. And uh, this is one of the cues that was improv. So I sent her the, the, you know, the piece of music without even a solo violin mock-up. I have this solo violin sample um, here. Which, you know, is fine, but I, you know, since this was an improv piece, I didn't want to give her any, you know, preconceptions about what I wanted it to sound like. I wanted her to react to the music and just play from her inner emotions. And that's indeed what she did, and it sounds beautiful. So there's just a little bit of the strings by themselves. So as you can see, I sort of went for the, the, the big, round, warm sound. And the way that I personally achieved that was I used Metropolis Arc 2 um, for the low strings, which sounds like this. So it has this very, very realistic tone, because you can even hear a lot of the room noise. And, you know, especially if you listen to a lot of, like, Benjamin Wallfish scores, you'll hear a lot of that. Um, he's a composer who really likes that, that realistic quality. Um, and some composers don't like that. Um, but I personally, for this score in specific, because it's sort of like this, um, I went for the more period drama sound, uh, composers like Desplat and, and Wallfish tend to use that, um, that type of sound a lot. So that's what I went for here. So for the cellos, I used Mural from Spitfire Audio. This is the library, of course, before Symphonic Strings. Um, they took all the, the Mural libraries and sort of um, collided them all into one for the Spitfire Symphonic Strings. And then for the Chamber Strings, they took all of the Sable libraries and, um, and that's Spitfire Chamber Strings, which I recently bought, and it's, it's fantastic. Um, I didn't use it on this score, though, but, um, but yeah, it sounds nice. So what we have going on here is, I believe, Albion 5. Let's go ahead and double check. Yes, Albion 5. Um, and so if you guys don't know already, um, Albion 5 is this very sort of uh, ethereal library that really focuses on detail. Um, and, you know, the whole idea of the library is um, recorded on the edge of silence, so it, it has this very, very interesting sound to it. And I use that in this cue to add a little bit of shimmer. Um, so let's just go ahead and solo that. So when we take our, you know, low strings and we combine that with, you know, the cello, and then we take Albion 5 and we put that all together, we get this. So then we have this section where the harmony sort of finally comes in. Um, so let's just go ahead and solo our three main voices, which sort of outline the harmony. So we added in a viola from, you know, again, Mural, and we have our high strings from Bishopus Arc 2, and our cello, and all three of the voices together sound like this. So when you get, you know, that sound, because the way that we voice it, when you take that and then you add this big, rich string bed under it, you have your sort of nice, fluttery, pulsing con sordinos, and then a really, really high D in your string arrangement. You add it all together, you get this sound. So there's just a little bit of that. Uh, let's go ahead and go to the sort of end of the piece where we introduce our harp and everything like that. So here it is. So we have our harp sort of fade in. And then this is again Metropolis Arc 2. So the thing that I do love is Metropolis Arc 2 has this nice, subtle legato transition, which is really, really nice. And then at the end of the piece here, we sort of wrap everything together with this, um, these sort of big chords.
so that sus chord at the end, you know, D minor sus four to D minor, uh, that's something that I like to use a lot. It has this very, very cool sound to it. Um, and so, yeah, so when we get into this section, we sort of enter, I don't know, I guess a bit of displotty territory, especially with our woodwinds, which we'll talk about in a second. But we have this harp, you know, um, really outlining our harmony, and then we bring in this big conclusion, which is pretty much the title card of, of the sequence, uh, where it sort of um, really sends you into the film. So we wanted that big, big uh, sound, uh, which we did with these with these strings. So, so overall, really, what it is, um, you know, when programming strings, uh, you know, it's really about first of all, I personally think writing and voices. Uh, so here we have, you know, all these different legato voices. These are pretty much all legato voices. Um, the only actual ensemble patches that we use are for our high strings um, down here in uh, Albion Five. So when you take individual voices and you and you voice them properly, um, you know it, it sounds really cool and rich, uh, and that's the sound that we went for here. Alrighty, so let's talk a little bit about woodwinds. So in general, I mostly use um, Berlin woodwinds, including for my solo woodwinds, uh, which is the you know Berlin woodwinds expansion B. Um, so let's just go ahead and listen to our winds here. So what we have going on here is a little technique called imitation. So this is a technique that I learned while studying Baroque music, interestingly enough, and it sort of translates pretty well to film music. But, you know, we have this little figure come in this... Um Da 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 da, and we bring it in with our flutes, and then we bring it in with our clarinets to sort of, um, to sort of repeat it or to sort of echo it, and then we have this little line with the oboes come in here, and then we have a bassoon line again that sort of imitates it but adds in a few extra um, notes, sort of ornament it and to you know add something new and rich, and then here we have our flutes. which is also, again, going up against this line right here. So we have, you know, this um, imitating, or this imitating this, and then these two imitating this line. Um, so, um, so yeah. All right, so let's just talk a little bit about our brass. I'm pretty sure we're using, okay, yeah. So euphonium. So this is a euphonium from Metropolis Arc 2. Again, I'm a big fan of this library. It's great. Um, but, yeah, so the euphonium is a member of the brass family, and it's sort of this, um, this very big, strong, intense French horn pretty much uh, but in Metropolis Arc 2 it has this very nice soft tone to it that works very very well um, you know doubling with the cello so those two sound like this you sort of get a lot of the warmth uh, from the um, the horn but then you get that that nice tone that sort of complements it very very well from the cello and then when you add that um, to the pedal note all works pretty well together. So the only other thing we have going on in terms of brass is when we get into this section, which is when we go from D minor to B flat minor, which is quite an intense chord change. You know, this is uh, D minor, and then to B flat minor. Because the whole entire piece has been this D minor pedal note, and then here we get to this B flat minor, and it's like, oh god, it's dark. You know what I mean? So, so that's really what we wanted there. So, um, so yeah, that's just the brass. What we have going on here is Metropolis Arc 2 choirs again. That's what I mainly use. Um, I'll just go ahead and solo this out so you can hear it and play it. So yeah, the main goal of the choir in this piece is to sort of add a little bit of nice warmth to the strings. So if we just, um, you know, solo these two out together. Adds a very, very human element to it. And the thing that I love about the choir is that it just has this, this, the sense of humanity to it because of course it's like people singing so you just hear the voices of these people and it adds a really really nice effect and so here we have men's choir and then later in the piece we have this um, B section where we introduce the female choir which sounds like this mm -hmm. 
So if the choir is being used in a soloistic way, meaning you know you don't hear anything else other than the choir, I'll most commonly write it um, using multiple voices. Um, but you know when it's under a big string bed like that, I'll usually just pull up the the ensemble patch and and play it like that. Um, but it all really depends. Like if you have something that's very exposed and very out there and you can really, really hear it like the strings in this piece, I think it's really important to focus on the voicings. Um, so that really comes in handy when the choir is on its own. Um, so here at the end, uh, our choir is doubling these big chords that we have. So if we just play those two together. So let's go ahead and check out our percussion. So I'm pretty sure this instrument, yeah, so these are the low booms. Yes, low booms from the low hit section of Hans Zimmer percussion. And I use the Junkie XL mixes all the time because I love the mixes. They're so big and powerful. They have a lot of space to them. And this is a drum that I use all the time in really every single type of music because it has this low, this low sub hit to it. But then it also has these guys which are really, really great and very, very versatile and can be used in a multitude of ways. Then we, of course, also have over here a nice little crescendo tool. So I use that all the time. Uh, but in this piece, for our crescendos, we use timpani rolls, which sound like this. So yeah, I mean, that's really all we have going on in the percussion. And a piece like this, you know, the percussion is not your main deal. Um, your main deal is really your strings, your brass, and in this case, the choir, because uh, we really use the choir to to add warmth to the, to the strings. So let's go ahead and take a look at everything else, which is just pretty much synth um, and pianos. So synth here... We have a nice, cool, cold, grim pad, uh, which this one is Backstreet Dentist, which is a pad from Albion 2, from Spitfire Audio's Albion line. Uh, it's an interesting name. Wow. It's a very nice sounding patch, though. Um, and then here we have a patch from Era Medieval Legends from Eduardo Terralante. So that just goes to show you can use medieval sample libraries in... World War II period drama documentary films. So, you know, it all really depends. But it has a nice sound to it. Alrighty, so here is everything else. So we have our pianos, uh, which come in towards the end of the track. But we also have something that I put down here for some particular reason called room tone. And it is exactly what it sounds like. It's just simple room tone. Um, and let's just go ahead and see how that sounds like by itself. And it's sort of something you'd think not to do. You'd think, you know, let's make my mix as clear as possible. But a lot of the times, if you're trying to, if you're trying to get somewhat of a realistic sound, a lot of the times samples completely try to eradicate um, a lot of the room tone and a lot of that type of stuff and make the samples as clean as possible. But when you're listening to, you know, scores, actually go in and listen, you can hear a little bit of that room tone. And you get that a lot from libraries like, um, you know, Metropolis Arc 2. Not so much at all from libraries like Cinematic Studio Strings and a lot of Spitfire Audio stuff. But I like to add just a little bit of extra room tone under the mix to sort of give it that give it that nice little kick. Alrighty, so over here we have our sort of ending section. Um, so we have the Spitfire Labs piano, which is sort of working in coalition with our harp, uh, and that sounds like this. And then I bring in Celeste over here, which adds a nice little shimmery sound.
and of course the celeste is doubling what our woodwind instruments are playing um, so doubling is really really nice technique that allows you to explore even more colors than are that are given to you you know if you have a violin viola cello bass you know all your woodwind instruments your brass instruments that's not where it ends when you combine different instruments you get even more colors and I think it's some of the best composers that, that we all look up to like John Williams who knows how to utilize um, you know doubling and really knows what happens when you combine this instrument with this instrument and there's so many different possibilities in terms of what can happen so so that's just a little overview of um, you know 1M1. It's relatively simple. There's not a lot going on, um, but hopefully that helps. Um, and if you guys have any further questions, please let me know. Um, and yeah, so thank you so much for watching, and uh, I'll see you guys later.